Is everybody able to see that? Yes. Excellent. Beautiful. Hi, Sam. Looks good. Good. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure people will be coming in and out, but hopefully uh, I don't want to wait too long for everybody to figure out how to get on Zoom. So, all right. Thank you all for joining me. This is going to be a class that runs the next five Mondays at this time at 8 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and the name of the class is Understanding the Tradition of Byzantine Chant. And the idea is to provide a cursory overview for those of you who perhaps are sort of new to the amount of Byzantine chant you're now hearing in services due to COVID uh, shutting down choirs. And so a lot of parishes in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese had to switch to just one chanter instead of a choir, especially for Sunday liturgies. And I had talked to uh, my priest about it, Father Andrew Barakos, and sort of talked about how it was such a be such a culture shift for people who haven't come to other services. So even though the GOA typically uses Byzantine chant for Orthros and Vespers and any other ancillary services, most people only come on Sunday liturgies when they hear a choir. And so there'd be a lot of things they weren't used to. And so the idea is to provide sort of a basic framework of what's happening, what, what is the chanter doing, uh, you know, maybe make some things that seem random, explain the logic and the design behind them, and perhaps just allow people to have a better framework to understand what's happening in worship whenever Byzantine chant is the main uh, musical system used for um, divine liturgy. And so we're going to focus on different aspects and we're going to start today as sort of the introduction and overview of the basics of Byzantine chant itself. What are you hearing? Um, what is the musical design? Like what is the goal of Byzantine chant? Uh, why are some hymns shorter and some longer? Though some hymns take forever, other hymns are really quick. Uh, where does chant tradition even come from? We're going to talk about those things in this class. And then in class two, we'll focus on the history as to why Byzantine chant is the way it is, how it developed, how it became what it is today, all the different uh, things that came together to make it uh, the way it is now. Um, talk about the eight modes. Probably some of you at least have heard of the eight modes or the idea that we have eight modes. So we'll talk a little bit about what are they? What are the eight modes? Um, we won't really get into how to chant them or anything because that's a different topic, but we'll just talk about what they are. And uh, then we'll talk about the development of chant from the early church until now. And related to that is how text and music intertwine together because um, if you've been to really any amount of Greek Orthodox services, it's a lot of words that get sung through any service. Um, and the music is designed to proclaim text. And so we're going to talk about how they feed into each other, how that's a symbiotic relationship. Class three, we'll get more into the specifics of uh, daily services, specifically Vespers and Orthros. Uh, if you are somebody who hasn't come to Vespers and Orthros, this is designed to maybe encourage you to give it a shot. And for those of you who have come, it's going to explain what's happening in those services from the perspective of the chant stand, why some parts are read versus other parts being sung, uh, and what the structure of the services are. Uh, and then the class four, we will talk about Byzantine chant as used in the divine liturgy. Uh, what hymns don't ever change in the melody and why? Things like through the intercessions of the Theotokos, save us, O Son of God. They're the same melody every week. We'll talk about why. But then we will talk about hymns that don't change in text, but will change in mode. Things like the Cherubic hymn, It is Truly Right, the Communion hymn. And then we'll talk about hymns that change both in text and in the melody. So, um, you know, the Apolitikia, the hymns that you hear, dedicated to the resurrection rotate every single week. So we'll talk about 
what those hymns are, where you find them, and uh, why they change. And then the fifth class will be an open Q&A in which I'll ask you all to submit questions ahead of time that then we'll just have an open Zoom session like this and I will go through the questions and answer them and talk about them. And it will be designed to sort of be an open forum for everybody who comes and participates. So those will be the five classes that we have and we'll go ahead and get started on class one here. So uh, just so you know, I've got right now everybody muted. I would ask that as we go through uh, please let me get through the presentation first because I might answer the question you have on the very next slide. Uh, so I don't want to get bogged down in questions that then I'm going to answer for you. So what you can do if you think of a question, there is a chat box that you should be able to see and uh, be able to write in. And so please feel free to submit questions as we go through in the chat box. That way you don't forget them later. Or if you want to just write them down for yourself and think about them, you can then ask them. We will build into every class a Q&A session at the end. So we'll go through the presentation. Hopefully it'll only take about 35 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have about 20 minutes or so to discuss the material. Uh, so um, that's how we can go about that. So as you think of questions, definitely feel free to post them in the chat box and we will address them at the end. Um, so, all right. Let's go ahead and get started. So what is the purpose of Byzantine chant? Why do we have Byzantine chant? Uh, why does it exist? And I personally nailed it down to sort of these four reasons as to why Byzantine chant exists as a musical form for Greek Orthodox worship. The first thing is that it's an expression of musical prayer. Um, Byzantine chant is an extension of the prayer life of a Greek Orthodox Christian. They're very, they're very connected. A lot of the hymns that you would um, chant in church are also hymns that then you would chant at home, things like that. Uh, the other thing that Byzantine chant does is to create an atmosphere, create a specifically a prayerful atmosphere to drive the congregant towards repentance. And we'll talk about how Byzantine chant does that. But the goal of Byzantine chant is to create a certain type of atmosphere. Um, anybody who's a musician knows that different keys, different uh, sounds, different instruments, different timbre can change the mood of anything of you know whether it's background music in a movie or whether it's uh, music at a concert or a classical musical piece and Byzantine chant is used in that way to create a specific type of prayerful meditative atmosphere in the church uh, which then feeds into the next one which is to foster the spirit of repentance. Byzantine chant is really geared towards pushing the congregant to self-reflect and uh, understand their own sinfulness to then push them to strive towards theosis. And those of you who don't know theosis, it is the concept of continually striving towards union with God. It's something that if you've been through catechesis, you would have heard this word a lot. And Byzantine chant is one of the many ways that the Orthodox Church tries to use aesthetics to push the congregant towards repentance, which then helps in the process of trying to attain theosis. So these are all the things that Byzantine chant is doing. So if it's trying to strive towards theosis, that would generally mean that Byzantine chant has a certain internal logic to it, a certain internal theology to it, and it certainly does. So let's talk about that a little bit, the theological expression of Byzantine chant. What is Byzantine chant's theological perspective in terms of what it's doing? And it really extends from this idea that the source of the church's aesthetic forms are not simply from the surrounding culture. And what I mean by that is you can break down anything in the Orthodox church to a certain tied to a certain cultural expression. Like if we take iconography, for example, you can say, well, iconography is the natural evolution from early Roman mosaics. You know, they took the art of early Roman mosaics and applied it to holy figures and eventually developed certain norms around uh, the aesthetics of icons. And that's how we have icons. And none of that is false, but it does leave out a big half of the idea of icons, because that's all well and good. This idea that icons are this expression of Roman um, artistic um, norms that then were morphed for into Christianity. But the other half of that is that 
icons are from God. We believe that the icons are a reflection of the heavenly tabernacle of the, when we kiss the icon of a saint, we don't think we're just kissing a Roman painting. We are, we are venerating that actual saint or the mother of God or God, God itself. And uh, that's ultimately because we view liturgy itself as a mode of divine revelation. A Byzantine chant is a part of that. So the aesthetics, in other words, are not vehicles of grace. They aren't just an empty vessel that you put grace in and then you get the grace out of the vessel. It is the grace itself. Uh, it's the reality and the fullness of uh, the grace of the church. And American culture really reflects the opposite values in the sense that both academic and popular religious values is the idea that things are symbolic and they're vehicles. So if you go to your typical megachurch Protestant church, they would really push back against the idea that even a wooden cross is the grace itself. They would at best say it's a vehicle of grace and that's why they reject icons and things like that. Um, and then what I mean by academic in terms of American culture is that academic would break it down as symbolism. This symbolizes this, this symbolizes that, but it's deeper than a symbol for us. Um, a great comparison I heard one time was, you know, if you're traveling far away and you have a spouse or a family member that you deeply care about and you carry a picture of them in your wallet and then you pull that picture out and you kiss that picture, well, you're not kissing the piece of, you know, the piece of vellum or whatever it is that the picture's printed on. You're kissing the person. It's somehow um, emotionally speaking, it's a connection to the actual person that that picture is of. And so saying, well, it's just a symbol of the person doesn't quite summarize exactly what is happening. And this is true for the aesthetics of the Orthodox Church. And some scriptural examples of that would be like Jacob's dream. If you've ever read in the Old Testament, Jacob's dream, he has a dream of angels and of a ladder, which is where the ladder of divine ascent comes from. Uh, and he wakes up from this dream and he immediately builds an altar. Well, what does his altar look like? Well, the altar looked like the altar that we would see in an Orthodox church. In other words, Jacob has this divine revelation of what is actually um, divine and heavenly. And he builds it based on the image in his mind's eye from this dream. And it physically manifests as an altar that we would see in any Orthodox church that we walk into. And so that means it is the grace. It's not a vehicle of the grace. Moses, same thing, is shown the heavenly tabernacle. Uh, he descends from Sinai and builds a material imitation of that celestial tabernacle. And this is an altar, just as we would see in an Orthodox church. And so this is why we study the early fathers of the church, because they were not simply present historically when things like Byzantine chant, iconography, um, uh, architecture, all of these different aspects and elements of the uh, vestments, all of this uh, became part of the Orthodox Church. They weren't simply present for it. They were the ones who gave shape to the forms. All of the early church fathers were interested in music and architecture and things like that. And so they very deliberately shaped these things as a way of divine revelation for the congregants. And Byzantine chant is a big part of that, that idea. It comes from that idea that listening to Byzantine chant in and of itself can help sanctify the soul. Um, and to continue on with that, everything in the church is more than the aesthetic. It's always a mode of divine revelation. And then a, another really important aspect that I was actually told by an Athenite monk, because he was talking about how they had some Catholic pilgrims visit Mount Athos. And they asked him, you know, while we're in church, what should we focus on? What should we be looking at? And the monk thought about it and then realized you can look wherever you want. What you need to be doing is listening. And that's really true of Orthodox worship. Focus of Orthodox worship is not visual. It's auditory. Uh, what's happening in the service is indicated by what the chanters are singing or what the priest is explain, exclaiming or what the choir is singing or anything like that. Um, there are a lot of times where you can't see what the priest is doing, where the doors are shut and they're hidden behind the iconostasis. And if you're just looking at the front of the church, it would look like nothing's happening. If you put, you know, if you muted everything, it would just look like nothing is happening. But at that moment, there's always something being chanted. And so the focus of Orthodox worship is not visual, it's auditory. Um, and so we should always be attention, uh, paying attention to what's being said. And so Byzantine chant is a vehicle for that. Uh, in general, music is a universal phenomenon as well. 
it's a fundamental character characteristically human trait uh every culture has music uh and it's also one of the few traits that really do completely distinguish humanity from animals uh, the development of music the sophistication of music is something that you can find a lot of things that humans do and maybe you know chimpanzees do this and other animals do that too and these birds are also monogamous and all these different things you can find in the animal kingdom that mirror human behavior except the complexities of music it's a very human thing and it's universal across all cultures and then finally creation itself from the orthodox perspective taken straight from genesis is the result of sonic activity uh, God spoke creation into being. Um, so the conclusion of that is basically what the cantor is doing is extraordinarily important in uh, the Orthodox Church. It's a vital aspect of the Byzantine synthesis, which is a term coined by a priest named Father Robert Taft, who was describing how everything in Greek Orthodox worship comes together to produce a certain um, spirit, a certain mindset, a certain phronima, the architecture, the domes, the iconography, the priest's vestments, the candles, the incense, um, all of it is there to produce a feeling. And another part of that is Byzantine chant. And it's important, can't be overstated, because all of the other things I mentioned, you could have perfect icons, perfect vestments, a perfect dome, perfect incense, it smells great. Everything's great. And if the chanters sound terrible, you're going to walk out of the service nine times out of 10 going, man, those chanters were bad. Um, it dominates everything else. It throws out the synthesis. And that's true of anything else. If uh, the priests came out in vestments that were off center and looked goofy and the crosses were wrong and they were upside down, you wouldn't pay attention to everything else. You'd be like, man, that priest's vestments were really weird. Why did he have upside down crosses on his vestments? Um, and so the Byzantine synthesis is a very delicate thing in which everything has to come together to be able to produce the proper effect. Um, and so thus learning the proper forms to chant is a labor of love for God and a part of one's suffering and struggle to offer up one's talent to the service of the Lord, just like iconography is, just like being a priest is, just like helping clean the churches, just like being in philoptokos, anything like that. Um, it's to provide a ministry for and on behalf of the congregation. So that's the theological idea behind Byzantine chant and behind being a chanter. So let's talk about the origin of Byzantine chant. The origin of Byzantine chant can really be summed up into the synthesis of two elements. And that is the role of the cantor in the synagogue. If you go to a traditional Jewish synagogue, I know that there are reformed synagogues that kind of have their own versions of Protestants and things like that. But if you go to a very traditional uh, synagogue, there's going to be a lot that looks very familiar to a Greek Orthodox Christian. Uh, you're going to have a cantor who stands on the right hand side at a chant stand who then leads the congregation singing the certain hymns and prayers. So you have the role of the cantor in the synagogue was imported directly into the early church, which we'll talk about next week when we talk about the history of Byzantine chant. But then you also are unifying that, synthesizing that with Byzantine era Hellenistic musical theory. In other words, all of the music that we're singing, it all extends from uh, music of, of the Greek world at the time of late antiquity, um, you know, anywhere between 500 and 1200 AD. So uh, those two things are what combined create the environment that gave uh, birth to Byzantine chant. So what are we hearing in church? You're listening to, to chanters chanting. What is it you're listening to? Byzantine chant is made up of two musical elements that happen simultaneously. The first one is what is called the melos. And the melos is only the, it's just the Greek word for melody. In fact, melody comes from the Greek word melos. Uh, the melody is applied to the text of the hymn. The text of the hymn combined with the sung musical notes is what makes the melos. So, you know, Lord, save your people. If you take away the, the, the text, it's not the same thing. And if you take away the music, you're just reading. And so those two things make up the melos. And then you also have the ison, also called the drone. Um, and it is a drone note that lays at the base of the melody provides a tuning foundation for the person chanting the melos or the people. 
And it also adds an element of mystery and beauty, contrasts the florid, ever-moving melos. So you have this really um, uh, moving melos that goes up and down. It's very florid. It's very melismatic. Um, and then the ison is the opposite. It's unmoving. It stays on one note. doesn't move very often, if at all. Uh, so those are the two contrasting elements that you're listening to when you make a Byzantine chant. So let's listen to a quick example here. I will uh, play something that sort of shows you listen for both the melody and the ison. All right, so there you would have heard um, the expression, both the ison and the melos, and how they work together. Because the melody was very florid, lots of trills, lots of melismas, as they would call. And then the ison just stays right underneath that. And so those are the two things you're seeing. What would be missing that maybe you would have heard in other churches or in other Greek Orthodox churches? The first one is no instruments. Byzantine chant does not have a tradition of using instruments in it. Uh, the early church fathers were very vociferous in speaking out against instruments, actually, the, like in the early church. Uh, and thus that tradition held in the Orthodox Church as a whole, Slavic, Arabic, Greek, until about the 19th century in Greek Orthodox diaspora communities in Western Europe and the USA, you then started seeing the organ being used uh, because they were in places in which the organ was common. So the first organ ever used in a Greek Orthodox Church was actually in 1848 in Vienna, um, Austria, because other churches in Vienna, Austria had organs. And so they, that's where the organ comes from. But up until then, that's why Byzantine chant, which is obviously much, much older, does not use instruments in it. Um, and that's also why American churches, you'll see organs. But if you go to Greece and the Middle East, you won't. Uh, and then I included this quote from Clement of Alexandria, who died in 215 AD. So 1800 years ago to show how strongly early church fathers, and this is very early, 200 AD, did not want instruments involved in the church. And they, this quote says, let the pipe be resigned to the shepherds and the flute to the superstitious who are engrossed in idolatry. For in truth, such instruments are to be banished from the temperate banquet, being more suitable to beasts than men and the more irrational portion of mankind. The tongue is the psaltery of the Lord, for man is truly a pacific instrument, while other instruments, if you investigate, you will find to be warlike, inflaming to lust, or kindling up amours, or rousing wrath. And so a lot of early church fathers saw instruments as being part of warfare and as being part of pagan celebrations, and that's why they didn't want them in the Christian church. And so that held for about 1800 years in the Orthodox Church, uh, and it held in Catholic churches until about 1200 AD, you didn't really see instruments until even later too. So that's why Byzantine chant doesn't use instruments because uh, the origins you had, the instruments were just a no-go in the early church. They wouldn't do it um, for whatever reason. So it was really quite interesting if you do some reading on it. And, and you can even read, some of them didn't even like uh, 
singing tropadia, like basic things that we sing all the time. Now you have some early church fathers who say church should just be prayer and silence. It's really, it's interesting to read some of the early church stuff on music. Um, they had very strong opinions. I'll put it that way. And then the next one is harmonies. You won't hear harmony. Like in the piece we just listened to, it was just one part with the E son. The early church also rejected harmonies because they preferred one melodic line to facilitate the call and response nature of the divine services. And what I mean by that is, you know, think of again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. That's call and response. The priest says something, the congregation and or the choir and or the chanters reply. <clears throat> that was put into the services from day one. And because of that, they didn't want to include harmonies because you got to think that the early church is before the invention of written music. And so harmonies would have all had to be memorized. And it's a lot harder to memorize four parts than it is to memorize one part. And so because of that, the early church did not include harmonies. Harmonies did exist uh, in ancient Greek music and different things like that. In uh, secular music, pagan religious music, there were harmonies, but they didn't use them in the early church. And so Byzantine chant developed out of that. And that's why Byzantine chant never developed a tradition of harmony, of four-part harmony. Eson is the exception to that because Eson does provide harmony. Um, it is, and what's interesting is that Eson is actually a borrowing from the West. Uh, early Roman forms of chant, Roman meaning literally from Rome, uh, had a drone underneath it before Byzantine chant began to use it. It was something that started in the West and moved East, um, interestingly enough. And then it's also important to mention that harmonies did, unlike instruments, harmonies did develop in the Slavic Orthodox churches many, many centuries ago, uh, a thousand years ago plus. And Orthodoxy has a strong polyphonic tradition outside of Greek, in Eastern Mediterranean churches. So outside of Greece, uh, the few churches in Turkey, Lebanon, Jer uh, Israel, Jerusalem, and Mount Sinai, they all use Byzantine chant. But in the Balkans, in Russia, in the Ukraine, all of these places, they have a strong and very ancient polyphonic tradition. In fact, Georgian polyphony is some of the oldest in the world. So anyway, Byzantine chant has an antiphonal structure. So let's talk about what that means. Uh, Byzantine chant is designed for antiphonal chanting and has been since the ancient church because antiphonal chanting was actually an element of the Old, Old Testament synagogue, the whole call and response idea of going back and forth, of saying one thing, somebody replies. This uh, designed with the clergy back and forth as I demonstrated, but also between two different choirs. And so Byzantine chant is actually built around the idea of antiphonal chanting. And chanting without two choirs is actually harder than chanting with two choirs. Um, so if you ever go to a church or hear antiphonal chanting with two sides, a right choir and a left choir, that's how it's designed. All the services are designed around this idea. Certain choirs take certain parts based on whose turn it is. Um, so. The hymns of the church are divided to be sung by a right choir and a left choir. The right choir leader is called the protopsalthis, which means first cantor, literally proto, first, one, and psalthis just means chanter. Uh, and the protopsalthis is the lead chanter, so he would be head of the whole program. He's um, the CEO of the chant, uh, chant portion. And then the left choir leader is called the lambavarios, which actually means light holder because the Lambavarius would hold the candle for the emperor in the Byzantine empire. And thus the name stuck even after the Byzantine empire fell. Um, so you have a Protopsaltis and a Lambavarius. That's the two titles that you would hear. If you have a full chant choir, in other words, more than just a couple chanters, each side would get what's called a domesticos. So you would have a Protopsaltis and then a domesticos and a lambadarios and a domesticos. And these are sort of like the top assistant chanter for each side. Um, the choir is then f uh, filled out with other helping chanters and those who would hold the eson. You would have specific people who would hold the drone, who uh, that's their job. Their only job is to hold eson. 
And so I have a video here of what that looks like. This is a live video from the Patriarchate of Constantinople, I think last year, 2019, that is of the chant choir there. And so it'll sort of be a good demo. You can just see the interaction of the Protopsatis, his domesticos will be chanting with him and then everybody else who surrounds him who's helping out. So that's a good demonstration. You could easily tell who was in charge. You saw the person to his immediate right was singing along with him and then everybody else was helping out with either Isan or singing the melody. Now, where does chant tradition come from? We have all these rules and all these peculiarities to the chant tradition. Well, where does this come from? What is the origin of the chant tradition? And what we call the chant tradition, a term is the received tradition. And what that refers to is what we do now because chanting is over 1500 years old. So there's a lot of phases and elements to the chant tradition. The received tradition refers to what is still done today in 2020 at the chant stand. And we had two major historical events that helped shape what I do at the chant stand, what other chanters do at the chant stand. The first is there was a consolidation of the patriarchal tradition referring to the Patriarchate of Constantinople by a chanter named Petros Lambavarios, the Peloponnesian in the 1770s, right around the time America was being born. And you can tell by his name, his name is Petros Lambavarios. And so if you remember what Lambavarios means, it means he was the left chanter at the Patriarchate of Constantinople at the 1770s. And what he did was he wrote everything down that they did at the Patriarchate, that chanter sung when, you know, at this point we sing this, at this point we sing that for a whole year. He wrote everything down, um, which is a monumental task because you do a lot throughout the year in church. Um, even if you only do Saturdays and Sundays and Holy Week and certain feast days, you do a lot. And he wrote it all down. And then in the year 1814, so, you know, 30, 40 years after Petros uh, consolidated, what they did at the Patriarchate, uh, they had notational reforms of 1814. And the Byzantine notation of 1814 is what chanters use today. It's what I use at the chant stand. Um, and this modern received tradition, this combination of the reform of the notation and the work of Petrus and Bavarius is what is referred to as classical. So if you hear a chanter say, what's the classical piece for this, classical this or that, that's what they're talking about. And what does classical mean? Well, it functions very similar to how classical works in Western music. So in Western music, classical is an era, right? It's the time of Mozart and the beginning of Beethoven and Haydn and all these people. There's a specific time period in which classical music became classical music. But you could also write a piece of classical music today if uh, a composer could write a new symphony of classical music tomorrow and present it with his symphony if he was the director of a symphony, you know, at, at any time. And it would be considered classical music. So obviously classical music isn't only limited to the time period that we think of, the time period of Mozart and et cetera. That's the same in Byzantine chant. It's a time period, 
roughly 1750 through 1840, but it's also a style because modern composers can compose in a classical style. So it serves as both for chanters. They'll use the term to mean both the time period and the style of music. Byzantine notation. So I talked about here, notational reforms, and I talked about the consolidation of, of the patriarchal tradition. Well, how did they do that? They used Byzantine notation, which looks like that. That's a piece of Byzantine notation from 1790, I believe. What the music is that chanters use. Byzantine notation, some interesting facts for you. Byzantine notation is the oldest continuously used musical notational system in the world today, by far. Um, it uh, has over 1,000 plus composers that we know of who have composed using Byzantine notation throughout the centuries. There are over 7,500 manuscripts of Byzantine notation uh, that we have so far found, with more being added every day. And it's been used since the ninth century up until today. So since the 800s. This is what it looks like. This is a piece of Greek Byzantine notation published in the year 1846, which is after 1814. So this is a piece of music that I would maybe use myself. This is a setting by a chanter named Petros Ephesius, which if you can see my mouse, it's right here. That's his name. But Petro Ephesius. So Peter of Ephesus is what that means. It's in the plagal of the fourth mode. This tells me that right here. And the hymn, I can just, Kyria ian poles amartias, which is the hymn of Cassiani. So this is a setting of the hymn of Cassiani, uh, written in Byzantine notation and published in the year 1846. Here's a piece of Byzantine notation. I would actually use at my church on a Sunday. In fact, I would have used it. I did use this. Uh, two weeks ago, because this is in fourth mode. So this is what it looks like when used with English, because you can use Byzantine notation with a bunch of different languages. It's used in Romanian, it's used in Arabic, um, and obviously Greek, and in English, as well as Old Slavonic. Um, and so the bottom part are the words, and the top part is the music. This is what the music looks like. So this is what we use when we chant. Here's another piece of a shorter hymn, because this is a longer hymn. You can tell by how long the word praise is stretched out. And here's a shorter hymn, where you have just one note per syllable, basically. And then here's one in Greek. That's a little bit cleaned up compared to the old one I showed you. So this is one I would have, I actually used this morning. All right. So let's talk about why are some hymns shorter and some are longer. We looked at a long hymn here, then a short hymn here, and a shorter hymn here. So why are some hymns shorter and some are longer? There are three different categories of music in Byzantine chant. The first one is what we would call irma logic. These are pattern melodies, short hymns like the hymns for feasts and parish hymns. So those of you who go to my parish, Assumption, in giving birth, you remained a virgin. That would be considered an irmologic hymn. Pattern melodies are basically when you have a set melody and the text is written to fit that melody. So then you can sing the same melody to a bunch of different texts. Uh, the best comparison, this is something where when I first describe it, people kind of glaze over and are like, what? But it's actually not that hard of a concept. How many people here, just a few of you feel, raise your hand if your camera's on. How many people here know the melody Amazing Grace, could sing Amazing Grace, especially if they had the words in front of them? And there are multiple verses of Amazing Grace. I believe there are four. It's the same concept, because to be able to sing all four verses of Amazing Grace, the text of Amazing Grace has to fit the rhythm and the melody of the original melody of Amazing Grace. If the text doesn't line up, you can't make the text fit the words. It doesn't break right, and thus it ruins the melody. 
it's the same concept with Byzantine pattern melodies. You learn one melody and all the texts are written to match the meter of that melody. And then you can apply that melody to a bunch of different hymns. That's what Irmologic hymns are used for. So you don't use music with Irmologic hymns. You sing Irmologic hymns from text. Then you have what are called stichoraric hymns or in Greek, stichiraria. These are slightly longer. They're used for hymns called doxastika, which is in the word. These are hymns that are sung after the words glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. A good example would be it is the day of resurrection that you sing on Pascha, where you sing glory to the Father, to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then it is the day of resurrection. That's a sticker arc hymn. And that's sort of like your middle lane. They're a little bit longer. They're Well, they're a good amount longer than Aramologic, but they're still moving pretty quickly. And then you have your really long hymns, which are called papatic. And these are only used occasionally. These are used for mostly cherubic hymns and communion hymns. And there's something in common between the cherubic hymn and the communion hymn. And that is, it's a liturgical movement by the priest that the chanter is trying to cover, basically sing while the priest accomplishes a certain goal. So at the cherubic hymn, it's the great entrance. The priest has to get ready for the great entrance, prepare the gifts, organize the line, come out and walk around. So during all that time, you have to chant a hymn that textually is not very long. Let us represent the cherubim um, is not a very long hymn. If you just read it, it's, you know, one sentence. Uh, and so you have to make that last six, seven, eight minutes, depending on how fast your priest is. Uh, so thus you need a longer hymn to do it. And that's what Papatic is designed for. It's to create an atmosphere, uh, create a beautiful moment, while also providing a practical function of covering time while the priest does a liturgical movement. And then communion is self-explanatory. It's you got to cover communion, the amount of time it takes for people to take communion. You got to sing that whole time. And so communion hymns are very long for that reason. And so those are your three different styles of hymns that you hear in Byzantine chant, Irmologic, Stichoraric, and Papatic, short, medium, and long. All right, that's it for the presentation for me. We've got some time here. So let me see the chat here. Uh, don't see any questions. Um, But we can go. I'll go ahead and open it up to the floor. Who would like to ask any questions? Uh, you can digitally raise your hand. I can't see all of your cameras. We got a lot of people. But if anybody would like to ask a question, feel free to speak up. What's your favorite hymn? <laughs> I don't really have a favorite. It depends on when you ask me. So I have a lot. Well. I have a do you have a favorite for a particular season or, or, you know, for, for either Easter or yeah, I Christmas? Mean for, for Pascha, it's definitely, it is the day of resurrection. The one I mentioned earlier uh, for Christmas. I have, I've always liked um, this one hymn you sing in Vespers uh, in Greek. I'm trying to think in English. What shall we offer you? O Christ. It's a hymn where you it basically lists all the things that have been offered to Christ's birth and reflects on how the only thing we as humanity can offer him is his virgin mother. Um, mm. It's a really beautiful hymn. So I like that one for Christmas. Uh, for Lent, I really love doing the slow uh, Prochimenon, uh, turn your face away, turn not your face away that you sing at Sunday evening Vespers. Um, it's a beautiful hymn, but I have a lot though. I could go on for a long time. Hey Sam, I got a question for you. So I, you, you mentioned um, the different types of hymns just now and the, 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 the three different categories. Um, when somebody is just starting out, would you recommend um, learning the, the theory and what the, you know, the notes and what they do in terms of up one or down and how long you hold? Or is it, would you say it's kind of like cheating to, to just memorize the, uh, the different modes and applying the words to the different modes? I mean, an example that I always think of um, 
is I know you use the example of amazing grace, but I, you know, since I have a five, two and a newborn kid, baby at home, uh, as a father of young kids, I always think of like how the ABC song is the same as twinkle, twinkle, little star, <laughs> you know? So I always think that if I can just memorize those different melodies and learn the words, then, then I can, then, oh, I can start chanting in no time. But um, I've had some, some friends and teachers in the past tell me, no, 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 that's not the, that's not the way to learn to chant. You actually have to learn the theory and the notes. What would, what would you say? Depends on the student. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, message me privately about that one. Most people here don't want to learn how to chant, so I don't want to go into too much technical detail. Ah, uh, gotcha. But, uh, uh, but it does depend on the student and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Okay. Cool. All right. I got one question in the chat here. I've got, when you chant in what sounds like an off key or minor key, do you chant that way to give an otherworldly effect to the hymn? A uh, couple of points to that. First thing is what we might perceive from the perspective of our shared American musical culture as off key or minor key may not be so from the perspective of Byzantine chant. Um, so uh, for example, what we would call a minor key, um, like Christ is risen, the Christos Anesti, would be written in a minor key in Western music. But in Byzantine, it's actually considered what I guess you would call major. It's actually considered, it's called diatonic, which is sort of the major scale of Byzantine chant. And uh, so some of that is perspective, uh, but some, but the other half of that is yes. Sometimes certain modes are used for certain hymns because they provide a certain uh, sound and feel to that hymn. You know, certain hymns like on Holy Thursday evening, the crucifixion of Christ. There are a lot of hymns that are sung in a certain way to convey a certain emotion of mourning compared to then the triumphal sound of the hymns on Pascha. Any other comments or questions? Sam, this is Alexandra. I have a question around um, what's the role of the priest in all of this? So priests in general have to be at least somewhat decently versed in what is called ekphonesis, which is the spoken parts that a priest does. And it's not really spoken. So the way that the priest intones the petitions is what is called ekphonesis. And that is sort of how Byzantine chant expresses dialogue. It's also how a chanter would read the epistle. And so it sounds, you know, like again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord uh, for the peace from above and the salvation of our souls. Let us pray to the Lord. That scale that you've probably heard a lot of priests do is called ekphonesi. So they got to know how to do that. Uh, past that, it's sort of up to the individual priests like uh, Father Andrew. Um, he loves Byzantine chant, but he doesn't really know anything about it, my priest, and he <laughs> is open about that, and so he always kicks everything to me. Um, and other priests were maybe chanters before they became priests, and so they like to chant a lot, so then they'll steal a lot of stuff from the chanters, at least is how I look at it. They're always stealing my lines. But um, uh, So it can depend on the priest. It depends on their um, education level in Byzantine chant, how much they are able to do. You know, some priests struggle with tone deafness, which is not a problem I have, thank God. Our priests, even though they don't know a lot about Byzantine chant, have very nice sonority to them and can match pitch and do things like that. Uh, so it, it varies, to answer your question, Alexandra. It's really nice when a priest really knows their music, but it's not required for a priest the way it would be for a chanter. All right, any other questions? Sam, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, Ross Connor here. Uh, years ago, I've is it Father Chris Salami? Salami was he in the uh, uh, Phoenix area? I'm not sure where you're at, but yes. uh, when yeah, we're he was very in close Oklahoma, friends, he's my spiritual father. So I don't. There you go. Well, he uh, uh, when he first became he, he the first house he ever blessed was my house, and the uh, uh, first time I ever heard somebody really chant was Father Chris, and I was like, oh, this is this is interesting. So uh, uh, giving you that little tidbit, but uh, uh, I've sung in weddings and uh it's uh, the dance of isaiah and then i guess the thrice holy hymns different things that they might be either when a bishop comes maybe extended things but uh is the uh, the dance of isaiah always in a wedding yes but the dance of isaiah is just 
the um, Irmos for the ninth ode of the resurrectional canon of the Plegal first mode. So okay. you'd sing Danzo Isaiah in a lot of services, but it's also okay. sung at a wedding. Okay, okay. And then the, um, uh, what is it? Something to the Virgin Mary or something? I'm trying to remember all the different things that went in it because I basically, you know, they needed male voices at the Greek church. So <laughs> I wound up doing a lot of the stuff, maybe phonetically or whatever, but uh, mm. uh, learn it. Yeah, there, there's a lot of hymns you chant in a wedding. Yeah. There's quite a few. Anything that you have as a favorite? Oh, uh, no, not really. Ch chanting a wedding is pretty, it's pretty easy. I enjoy chanting <laughs> a wedding. It's a good amount of money for not a lot of work for me. So, Agreed. Uh, Marissa, yes. Howdy. Um, so I was wondering, so the classical era is from... Um, the classical era was from, you know, 1750 to 1840. What is the biggest difference? Because like in Western notation, there's a, or in Western music, there's a big difference between what can we consider classical and what we consider modern music, even modern like band or orchestral music. What's the difference, what's the difference between Byzantine music, uh, composed in the classical period compared to now? And what's the biggest difference between Byzantine music posted, posted, uh, composed in the classical period compared to all the way from when it really originated. Uh, man, that's a good question. That's like a PhD dissertation question. Yeah. Um, uh, so, classical era Byzantine musical compositions compared to now are much more synoptic. And what I mean by that is they don't write every note. The chanter is expected to add interpretation to it. Whereas a lot of more modern compositions in Byzantine notation from the 20th century, especially in the 1950s and 60s, they would write every single note in. It was very analytical. And so it would really, you would get these scores that were really uh, dense. Um, and then you had this revival of Cla classicalism basically almost like you can have a revival of classical Greece or ideas like that it was kind of that idea where then in about the uh, 1980s until now you had this revival of interest in classical era composition so a lot of chanters now write in a very classical style uh, but you had in the early 20th century this tendency to notate every single note to make sure everything was written and it created these really dense hard to read scores and the problem with that was it really raised the bar of entry for chanters being able to, to learn and chant these pieces because it, would, it was just so intricate that it was hard to learn. And so uh, classical Byzantine chant, there's a certain elegance to it and it can be very complex, but it's also very simple at the same time, which are also harm, hallmarks of Western classical music. Mozart, was it was almost a reaction against Baroque music, which was very heavy and dense and ornate and then classical music was very simple where Mozart would take you know one idea and just expound upon just one musical idea and classical Byzantine chant is very similar uh, but this is something that you would have to be very versed in all these things to really understand the intricacy of, of them uh, and then to answer your other question though of how is it different from older pieces it would depend on what era you're talking about but generally the hallmark would be the expansion of musical ideas, the inclusion of more musical influences. Um, so older Byzantine chant is very simple and pure uh, and almost simplistic at times. Uh, they can be, some are not, but mo uh, many are. Whereas the Byzantine chant that we have today has incorporated a lot of elements from Western music and from Turkish music and from Greek folk music and synthesized it with Byzantine chant. So you get a much more expansive and um, expansive and um, fuller expression, musical expression than earlier Byzantine chant was. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, Presbytera. You're still muted. Okay. Uh, there we I'm go. wondering how you feel Byzantine music compares with 
you know, the four part harmony organ type music that we use in our churches or other Western churches in terms of drawing in um, potential converts to the church? I have no idea. I don't, I, mm. I, that part of it, how does it draw people in is outside my expertise because the only evidence I have on either side is purely anecdotal. Uh -huh. um, and you could talk to a hundred different converts and get a hundred different answers as to what drew them to the Orthodox church. Um, you could get Your one comment. convert who could maybe say, well, I really love the authenticity of Byzantine chant and I don't like modern Protestant music. So that's why I became Orthodox. And then you can meet someone who says, I really like the organ choir when I went to a Greek Orthodox church because it reminded me of the church I grew up in but I like the theology of the Orthodox Church, so I'm converting to Orthodoxy. So it's like you could get a bunch of different answers on that question. Uh -huh. And since it's not my job, I don't worry about it. <laughs> Above my pay grade, as I say, Father Andrew has to worry about that. I do not. <laughs> Abigail, yes. Um, yes, I, so I confess, I, I'm a recent convert and I was not super impressed with Byzantine chant when I first heard it. Um, I'm learning to chant now and definitely appreciate it more. Um, but I've also heard similar responses from Orthodox friends who were used to the polyphonic style. Um, any advice on how to encourage, you know, those of us from that kind of background to hear the beauty of Byzantine chant? Sure. Number one, listen to good Byzantine chant. I think a lot of people I've met in my life who don't like Byzantine chant, whether they were cradles who grew up in Greek Orthodox churches or recent converts, it's usually because they've heard bad Byzantine chant. Um, Byzantine chant is uh, one of those things where it's really hard to do really well. And when you do it really well, it's unbelievable and spiritually life-changing and a wonderful experience. And if you take even 10% off of that, it loses so much. And uh, so it's a very intricate art form. Um, and that's probably one of the tougher things about it. So I would encourage them to listen to good Byzantine chant, provide them with recordings of excellent versions of Byzantine chant. If you know of churches in your area that have good chanters, take them there, even if it's not your main church. Um, I would. That's the first step, because a lot of times, you know, like a lot of the cradle Greek Orthodox I've met who don't like Byzantine chant, they, would, they basically view Byzantine chant as the domain of elderly Greek men wailing in Greek and they can barely understand it. Um, that was the reputation of Byzantine chant for a very, very long time for a good reason. It existed for a reason. Um, and uh, I've had many people this is going to sound like bragging, but I'm just going to say, I've had many people come and say, I used to not like Byzantine chant, but I really like the way you sang that. It was nice, you know, things like that. And uh, whenever I then explore now, oh, what did you not like about Byzantine chant? It always boils down to when I was a kid, the chanter at my parish was terrible. And uh, people who grew up with good Byzantine chant, on the other hand, love it. And they're hooked for the rest of their lives. And that's true on the inverse. People I've met who hate organ choirs it usually means they grew up in a parish with a terrible organ choir in which the organ was too loud out of tune never tuned and half the choir was 75 plus year old ladies wailing and they didn't have any men singing in the choir and so they hate organ choirs and then you meet people who love organ choirs and you talk to them it's because they grew up in a parish that had a really vibrant organ choir and so every musical form has an expression that if done well, can sound quite beautiful. But whether that happens in parishes is up for debate. So uh, I guess that's a very long-winded answer to just say, make sure they're listening to good Byzantine music before they judge it. Any other questions? You haven't said much about Western notation. I don't know Western notation. Okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, I know it a little bit, but I don't know very much. So that's, I, I don't know anything about it. And I, do, I don't use it when I chant because I don't read it. And so I can't really comment on it one way or the other. Any other questions? Uh, 
Hello, Andy Pagonis here. Um, there was an earlier question from Presidenta. Is this recording going to be made available? Oh, yes. These will be recorded and uh, hopefully posted to YouTube. So, Okay. Also, I wrote in the chat, is there a good text or text that you recommend for other, you know, further study into the, uh, the aesthetics of Byzantine music and um, kind of the history, the development of it, rather than learning to chant? Um, you can read, uh, that's a tough one, Andy, um, a text that's about Byzantine chant and its history and development versus on how to chant in English. I'll have to think about it, look around. Um, I'll try and get back to you on that because I can't think of anything in English. I know a couple in Greek, but I don't know of any in English off the top of my head. Um, I've got, oh, I've got a couple questions here. Sorry, I was missing, uh, um, I was missing the chat, my bad. I have, do you think that Byzantine music is more or less helpful in mission work in the US? I think that boils down to how good your chanter is and how well you can train a chanter because one of the advantages of Byzantine chant, uh, unlike say four part choir music is that it scales well. And what I mean by that is Byzantine chant can sound really good with two people, Isan and a guy singing melody. And if the guy singing melody or the woman singing melody knows how to sing well, it can sound great with just two people where obviously four part music, you need four people at the minimum. And usually you kind of want to have at least a couple people. So right there, you're needing at least eight people to have a functional choir. Whereas for Byzantine chant, you only need two. So in that way, Byzantine chant can be helpful in mission work. Where it can be harmful is that it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy to learn how to do it well. And, the best, and one of the best ways to learn how to do it well is do it in an environment where it's being done well. In other words, Byzantine chant is a lot easier to learn if you're learning it alongside a good chanter at, and going to church and listening to the chanter as he chants at church. And if you're in a mission, you're probably not in that situation. So that can be the downside. Um, the internet has helped bridge that, bridge that gap a little bit, but not completely. Um, so, Joni, yes. Um, I was wondering, is there anything, I think one of the um, classes that you taught last year had some interesting information just with that particular chance where, and I know we're not doing like a church bulletin right now or weekly bulletin, but is there um, information that could be shared in a, a bulletin in the future about some information about the, the particular chant, if there's um, something unique to it that applies to that uh, celebration or feast or whatever? I don't, I don't know if that's a legitimate question or not, really. But <laughs> It is a uh, best place. Uh, the, if you go to the uh, Greek Orthodox Archdiocese website homepage, they always have write-ups on the feasts um, and discussions of the feasts and things like that. Uh, the OCA website, uh, the Orthodox Church of America, uh, they always have really good write-ups as well. Um, there's actually quite a bit of, th of things you can find like that. Um, even just if you've ever been to, I think like orthodoxwiki.com, com or dot org or something like that mm -hmm. it's basically yeah. wikipedia for orthodoxy and type in the feast day and something will come up and but does uh, it refer to the chant oh no does it sorry if, yeah that's uh, what i mean like if, if there if there's a particular chant that goes along with it what does it mean what were it root its roots who was it written by i don't know no nothing something like to that. No. nothing like that okay there hasn't been a lot of work done like that in english in general um that is widely available. It's usually uh, a few one-off things here and there that you can find. Um, and for the most part, all of that is available in Greek, but nobody's bothered to translate it into English. Okay. It's a good question though. I wish there was, it'd be great. I'm just thinking of more ways to engage people with the chanting itself. Yeah, it would be nice. The problem is, is I mean, I guess to be, blunt about it is like chanters didn't have a lot of avenues to do things like that until more recently the past maybe 15 mm -hmm. years uh for the first probably 100 years in america chant was definitely an afterthought um you know the focus was on choral music and choirs and chant was just mm -hmm. sort of the thing that they did in orthros uh it was the 
you know, as the domain of old men wailing in Greek. Um, women were typically intimidated or weren't allowed to go to chant stands. Um, and that was why women congregated to choirs. Um, and in general, chant was sort of always an afterthought. And it's only been in the past maybe 15 years where you've sort of seen this reversal of education and training and things like that. And it's slow moving and it's grassroots. And so it's, there's a lot of missing gaps there in terms of materials like that. Last question. Is it rude to try and chant along with you during church? No, it's encouraged. <laughs> okay. Okay. The only time it's kind of rude is if you really don't know the hymn, but you're belting it out anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. But if, but if, but really that there's only two times and we'll, we're going to actually talk about this in the future. So I won't delve too much into this, but there's only two times in the divine liturgy in which the congregation is expected not to sing along. And that is the Cherubic hymn and the communion hymn. Both of those times in terms of how Byzantine Chen is designed to interact with the service uh, the hymns are very long and ornate uh, and uh, hard to sing along with. Um, and the reason why is because it's creating a prayerful atmosphere. During the Cherubic hymn is usually the congregation is expected to be um, saying their personal prayers in preparation for the anaphora, which is when they sanctify communion. And then communion, you're taking communion and uh, mm -hmm. reflecting on um, ingesting the presence of God. And so thus, it's not expected to sing along at that moment. But everything else in the Divine Liturgy is designed to be sung along with. And we'll talk about that in class four in depth about what is supposed to be sung along with versus what is not. So no, it is not rude to sing along with the chanters. In fact, it's encouraged. Sam? Thank you. Yes. Uh, 20 years ago, we started a, a mission in, in the Oklahoma City suburbs and uh, Haldor Howard from uh, St. George in Oklahoma City uh, helped us get started. We had the, uh, you know, the eight tones. So we had the, uh, the, the weekly cycle that would change. So he basically made a CD for, you know, uh, one week, the next uh, for the, uh, the songs that we needed to have. And we basically memorized those each week. And so uh, we went from people had no idea what we're doing and the priest, you know, was invited, he would show up. And so each week he said, well, if you guys can't sing it, you know, just say it. Then all of a sudden he's going like, wow, what happened to you guys? What happened? <laughs> but it was Haldor from St. George Greek Orthodox Church in Oklahoma City that had helped us at least, you know, get along to do congregational singing because, I mean, basically we were small enough that we were the choir and then they kind of separate, but, uh, and then getting to the chanting and then uh, Charles Baz uh, came from St. Vladimir, uh, to Oklahoma City. So he wound up teaching us a lot about uh, Byzantine chant, but you also got to hear him like you were saying. And I would just tape record all the stuff to, you know, to pick up on it. And then he started offering some some classes, kind of like what you're doing. So uh, I appreciate that what you're doing because it, it'll go a long way. Thank you. All right. Any other final comments or questions? All right. Thank you all so much. It was wonderful to meet all of you. It was wonderful Thank to have you. you all here. And I will hopefully see you next Monday. Thanks, Sam. Blessed Thanks. Feast of the Good Christ, night. everybody. Thanks, Sam. Take care, everybody. Blessed Feast Day.